Git. What is it, why do you need it, and how do you use it? Imagine you're working on a large project and you want to introduce a new feature. So you open it up, you do some work, you go to test it, and nope. You go back, you change some more stuff, go back to test it, and still no. At this point you've changed so much and added so many unintentional bugs that it would be easier just to revert back to where you started. This is one problem that Git solves, among many other issues that you may run into without some form of version control. Before we can get into Git, we need to talk about version control. A simplified definition of version control is recording changes to your code base over time. This can even be something as simple as manually backing up your project's source folder. Version control has a good number of benefits for an individual user, but where it really shines is collaboration. GitHub's an example of a platform that adds collaborative features to a version control workflow. Rather than an individual's changes being immediately published, they are first proposed and reviewed by collaborators of the project. It's important to make the distinction that Git predates GitHub. Git isn't really dependent on any online host. You can add version control into your workflow entirely locally. And the only thing we're actually going to be using GitHub for is when we demonstrate how to push a local repository to a remote host. So with all of that in mind, what does Git actually do for you? How can it help you integrate version control into your workflow? Git is a distributed version control system. This means that the project and its entire history can be mirrored on a server and every one of your collaborators' machines. This eliminates the risks involved with a single point of failure. Git thinks of your project as a series of snapshots. Every time you make and save a change, Git will store a new snapshot of the entire code base in its current state. Git provides the means to break up your workflow into the development of individual components. This is known as branching. For example, when you write a new feature, you can first branch off from your currently working version and merge the changes back when they're finished and tested. With the proper Git workflow, you will always have a working version of your project. One of the most powerful aspects of branches is the ability to shuffle between them. Let's say you've branched off from main and you're working on a new feature. After a little bit of work, you come across an unrelated bug. You can make another branch off of main, fix the bug, merge the bug fix, and then update your feature branch, all without having to worry about the state of the feature branch. So if you're on Linux, Git is probably already installed, and you can check by trying to execute it. If you don't see this, you're going to have to install it through your system's package manager. I'm on Manjaro, so I'm going to use Pamuk. The easiest way to install Git on Windows is through the WinGit package manager. So first open up a command prompt window and type wingit search git. We need to take note of the package's ID because wingit is bad at resolving the name. So if we go down and we type wingit install dash dash id git dot git, it'll download the installer for us. So we're still going to have to allow this to execute. And when it's finished installing, we're going to open a new command prompt window and we're going to type git to verify the installation. And as you can see, everything's working well. And finally, if you're on Mac OS, the documentation says that if you try to execute git, it will install it. But I don't actually have access to anything to test that. So now that I've got Git installed on my system, I'm going to set up my credentials. And this process is the same across all operating systems. So I'm going to type git config dash dash global. And the global means that this is going to be used for every user of the machine. The first parameter is user.name, and I'm going to type my name. The second parameter is user.email, and I'm going to type my email. So before we can do anything else, we need a repository to work on. And there's two ways that we can get a repository. We can clone it from a remote URL, or we can initialize one in a local directory. So first I'm going to demonstrate how to clone a repository from a URL. I've pulled up this random GitHub project. I'm going to copy the URL, and I'm going to say git clone, and then the URL. 
And what this does is it clones the entire code base into a directory with the project's name. But since I'm not actually going to be using that for this video, I'm going to quickly remove it. And I have a project here that I'm going to initialize a git repository inside of. And to do that, I type git init. Now if we type git status, we can see the status of our repository. And there's two important pieces of information here. The first is the branch that we are on. We are on the initial branch, which is sort of the root of our project. And second, everything within our directory is still untracked. So we need to tell git to track our project files. And we can do that by typing git add and then a file. Looking at the status, we can see that the file has been tracked. If we want to untrack this file, we can type git rm cached and then the file. Now before we do our first commit, I want to tell git to track all of my project files. And I can do that by typing git add star. If you don't know what the star does, it's basically shorthand for all of the files in this directory. Now if we check our status, we can see that one directory is still not added, and that's because of the dot. This means it's a hidden directory, but we can still add it by manually typing git add and then the directory. Now to create the initial version of our project, we need to type git commit m, and then we have to specify a message. This message is usually whatever you've changed, like if you've added a feature, or if you fixed a bug or something, but this is our initial commit, so I'm going to type initial commit. And now Git has a record of all of our tracked files in their current state at the time of this commit. So if we check our status, you can see that there is nothing else that has been changed since the previous commit. So if I were to add a new file, let's say, and check the status again. We can see our new file, so let's commit it to the project. Let's say I've added the boilerplate for a new class or something. So I type git add new file, and I obviously want to preserve these changes, so I say git commit dash m, and then added new class. So let's say I write some new code within this class. and I want to see how the file has changed since the previous version. I can type git diff. So let's commit my new feature. Well, first we have to stage our changes. And now we have a good few commits. And we can see how the project has changed through the commits by typing git log. Let's once again change our new file and add some new code but say that we don't want this new code anymore. How can we get rid of the changes that we've made to this particular file? Well, we can use git restore. And if we have a look at the contents, we can see it's the exact same as it was the previous commit. But let's say that we want to get rid of our previous changes that have already been committed. Well, for that, we can use git revert and then head, head being the most recent commit on this current branch. And we're going to leave the message default. And now we can see that the new file is empty just as it started before the previous commit. So up until now we've been working on the master branch and it's generally considered better practice to branch off to add new features. This is because if you come across a bug while implementing a new feature and you fix the bug, you can commit the bug fix to main, but you don't necessarily have to commit the new feature. So to create a new branch, we type git branch and then the name of the branch. And to switch to it, we type git checkout and the name of the branch. Now when this branch is created, it's a one for one copy of the branch that it was branched off from, but it's its own completely isolated environment. If we were to change a file and add some sort of new code, track the changes, and commit it to the current branch, this change is only present on the feature branch. 
So when we're satisfied with our work in this branch and we want to merge it back into the main branch, we have to use git merge. So let me first print the contents of new file. And now we're going to switch back to the master branch. If we try to print our file's contents, you'll see that it's nothing. But if we say git merge feature, these changes will be merged into our master branch. Now finally we can delete our feature branch with git branch dash d feature. And that about covers everything that you need to know to start using git. These simple concepts make up about 90% of what you're going to be doing with git on a daily basis. But before we finish, I'm going to talk about remotes and how to push your code to a remote host. So first I'm going to be creating a new GitHub repository for the project. I'm just going to call it tutorial. So switching back to the terminal, I'm going to type git remote add origin and then the URL that I copied. And before we can push this branch to our repository, we need to tell git where to push it. And to do that, we say git push dash dash set upstream origin and then the name of this branch. Now finally, to push the code to our remote repository, I type git push. So now if I check my repository, I can see that my code has been pushed. Now the reason I didn't have to input any credentials is because I told git to store them. But if you're following along with a fresh install, it probably will prompt you for a username and a password. Now this prompt isn't exactly correct when it comes to GitHub because GitHub replaced password authentication with token authentication. So to get a token, you can go up to your profile and click settings developer settings down at the bottom and personal access tokens generate a new token and to make git save your authentication information you can type git config credential dot helper store but do be warned that if you set this flag git will store your information on your drive in plain text so don't do this on a shared system if you enjoyed this video, a like would be much appreciated and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. If you haven't already, check out guidedhacking.com for a step-by-step -step introduction to game hacking and an ever-growing catalog of content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.